Hi folks. So this is me. I'm Matt Jarvis. I'm Director of Developer Relations at Sneak. And Sneak are a cloud native application security company. So when you first start scanning your container images, um, it can be a bit disconcerting to discover that you might have um, large numbers of vulnerabilities in your images. Um, this is a scan I did last week on a vulnerable node image that I built. It's a fairly extreme example, but you can see that this image out of the box is showing as having over 800 vulnerabilities in it. So faced with this, a lot of us will just freeze like a rabbit in headlights um, when we get presented with this big list of CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposures, um, particularly if our focus is on application development and not system administration. Um, what are we supposed to do with this information? Uh, where do we start? Um, I just wanted an image to run my node application in, and already I'm facing this gigantic task uh, to make it secure. Well, the most important thing we need to remember is that fixing these things in containers isn't like fixing them in virtual machines or in real servers. Uh, we don't want to get into upgrading individual packages and starting to manage the whole system. We need to understand where vulnerabilities have got into our images before we can start thinking about what strategies we might use um, to remediate them, to fix them. And what we don't want to do is to have to read through every CVE, understand its impact, understand how you might exploit it, um, or to become too versed in the kind of dark arts of system administration. We're going to look for solutions which align with the paradigms of containers. So we want repeatability, uh, we want efficiency, and as much as possible, we want to stick with the ideas of immutability that come along with how we use containers. So the first thing that's worth understanding in this context is how the images we're using might be constructed. Um, our container images are constructed in layers, and those layers are coming from different places. Um, some of them we're creating uh, in our own Docker files, and some of them are being brought in as part of our build process. Um, it's likely we started from a base image in our Docker file, and then we added some of our own things during the build process. Uh, perhaps we made some configuration changes for our environment, and then we added some custom software. Um, depending on how we construct our Docker file, we'll end up with these things uh, separated into file system layers in our container image. And this layering gives us a good analogy to work with in terms of how we think about vulnerabilities. So let's start by thinking about base images and the best ways to uh, think about vulnerabilities in the software in, in them. So although we refer to this as a base image, um, it's likely that that image we're using is also constructed from a parent image, um, which then had software installed into it during its build process. Um, the parent image itself was then constructed in some way, um, perhaps even from a further parent image or by so some kind of root file system building tool. Understanding how the software that we're scanning got into our images in the first place is really the key to decide on our strategy for minimizing vulnerabilities. So as an example of this, let's take a look at the official Nginx image on Docker Hub. If we look at the Docker file for this image, uh, we can see that it's based on the Debian Buster Slim image, which then gets software and configuration added to it um, when the Nginx image is built. And in turn, the Debian Buster image is built from another Docker file, uh, which takes an empty scratch image and adds a tarball to it. And if we then research how this tarball gets built, it's an output from the Deberotype tool, which is a series of scripts um, used by the Debian project to build root file systems. This is obviously the way that Debian do it. Um, there are different methods by which these things get constructed for all of the other operating systems which are typically used as base images. 
Um, but the point of all of this is that even when we just look at our base images, the way that software gets into them can be a long and potentially convoluted process. And this can be difficult to follow unless you understand all these different paradigms. Now, some people might say that you should just use Scratch, build your own images, starting from scratch, basically an empty container. Um, while this might work well for compiled language binaries where we don't have any dependencies, Go or C, for example, but for most other things, you will end up being the maintainer for everything that goes into that image. And that can be a very big overhead on an ongoing basis. So, unless you want to become the maintainer of an entire base image, in most cases, you're going to want to trust an upstream provider for those base images and look to them for fixes to vulnerabilities in that base image. Don't try to fix upstream issues downstream. As soon as you do this, you become the maintainer. Um, in the long run, the overhead from doing that is likely to be significant, and it's going to require that you track more and more security issues in order to fix them in your deviated version than if you just stuck with the upstream image. So as we've just seen, to use upstream images, um, we really need to trust the entire chain of build processes which went into the image that we're consuming. And this can be difficult to follow clearly. Um, of course, this is no different from how we consume the majority of open source software. And so many of the same quality factors that might influence our choices there also apply here. Is the software maintained and updated regularly? Is there a broad community of users? Perhaps there are commercial companies supporting it. Um, this information is all available to you online. So take your time, investigate what it is you're actually using. So by trusting our upstream image provider, um, we really need to rely on pulling in fixes from upstream, uh, either by upgrading our base image or by using a different base image that might have less vulnerabilities in it. But picking a base image isn't always as easy as it looks. Um, for example, the official uh, Ruby base image in Docker Hub has lots of vulnerabilities in it, and it's very big. Um, this is fairly typical of official runtime images because by design, they need to be generalized for every use case. Um, so we could look at the slim version that's smaller, it has less vulnerabilities, or perhaps we look for another one. But there are lots and lots of tags in that repository, so how do we choose? Well. Those generic runtime images are probably not what you want for production use cases. Um, it's hard to tell which framework version they might be following, and that could change in the future. But Slim isn't automatically the best choice. Um, you get less vulnerabilities, but if you use Slim to build your images, you're gonna to start to need to manage the build dependencies because they're unlikely to be in that Slim image. So the best practice for this, as I'm sure most folks will know, is to use multi-stage builds, where we use that bigger, more generic image to do our software builds. And then we copy our build artifacts over into our slim version for production deployment. So in this way, we're not having to manage our build dependencies because they're gonna be in that generic image. And we still get to take advantage of the size and the reduced number of vulnerabilities of the slim version. And note in this example, we're also sticking to specific runtime versions. So we know exactly uh, what runtime environment we're getting, and we know it's not gonna change um, underneath us. So in terms of choosing our base image, here's some general recommendations. Trust an upstream provider to do the heavy lifting and vulnerability fixing for you. Uh, they're likely have bigger teams working on this stuff, and so they're likely to be fixing things more quickly. Pin your apps to versioned images, uh, at least major, probably minor. Uh, that way the ground's not gonna shift underneath you in the future. Uh, learn to love multi-stage builds. So you can use slim images in deployment while still taking advantage of proven combinations that you know are gonna work um, in build. And rebuild pretty often. 
Uh, lots of times this is going to get you security fixes as part of the build process. And then finally, kind of consider moving your pins every once in a while. Upgrading to new versions are also going to bring in um, more security fixes in those base images. And fixing these things isn't usually very hard. Um, from some research uh, we did at Sneak, over 40% of, of Docker image vulnerabilities can usually be fixed by upgrading the base image. And around 20% can be fixed just by rebuilding them because a lot of containers are going to run some kind of upgrade um, during the build process. So for our base images, if we're trusting an upstream provider, then we're going to rely on them for fixes, either by upgrading our base image, by choosing another base image which has less vulnerabilities in it. So what about the things that we are adding to the containers ourselves? Anything we add to the base image is now our responsibility to fix issues in it. Well, if we've just added a package from an upstream distro repository, perhaps we uh, installed an RPM or a DEB as part of our build process, then the same principle exists as with base images. We're not going to start building that package from source to fix vulnerabilities in it. We're going to get our friendly upstream maintainer to ship us an upgraded package, or we might remove that package if we don't really need it. We might change it, use something else. So what about code we're creating? Um, many of us are building containers that contain custom applications that we've written in-house and that we're packaging for deployment into our uh, production environments. And for our own applications, uh, typically most modern apps are based on a small amount of homegrown code and lots of third-party modules, libraries, which are usually open source. Um, this is a pattern that you'll be familiar with if you're developing in Java, in Node, in Python, in Go, and in many other languages. And our application dependencies are typically expressed in a file in our source code. For JavaScript, it might be a package.json. Uh, for Python, it might be requirements.txt. But the basic principle is the same. We're defining which dependencies and which versions we need for our particular application uh, to be packaged up with our source code into a into a deployable um, a deployable unit. Now, this isn't a bad thing. Um, having reusable code means we write less code. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, um, and we can spend more time on the functionality we need. But we do need to be aware of what's going into our image. Um, each of the things that we uh, define as a dependency can have a large dependency tree of their own, things that they need that they'll bring in automatically. So potentially, we might bring in a ton of other modules which we might not even be aware of. And these indirect dependencies, um, we have much less control over them. And again, we might not be aware of them at all. And uh, um, typically, uh, over 70% of all security vulnerabilities are found in these indirect dependencies. So there are a couple of different ways that you might deal with vulnerabilities introduced here. It depends on the tooling you're using. Um, here, we're looking at a sneak scanner, that same container image we started with. And Sneak has actually identified the package.json for our application um, inside the image, uh, giving us a pretty clear picture of, of which vulnerabilities are coming from the base image and which are coming from the dependencies of our application. But we can also scan our applications directly in GitHub before they get included into our base images. And um, here in this example, Sneak's identified vulnerabilities in the in the packages for the application. But because we've got the Docker file there, um, it's also picking up vulnerabilities that would be in that base image used, that was built by using that, that Docker file. Again, you know, most tools are going to give you uh, these kind of functionalities to be able to uh, to scan your um, your third party dependencies. So whichever way you end up separating out the vulnerabilities, um, it's probably not realistic except for uh, very simple applications to expect your container image to have um, no vulnerabilities at all. Um, vulnerabilities themselves are not a zero-sum game. Um, a particular vulnerability 
uh, may only be an issue under very specific circumstances on a specific architecture, specific platform. Um, without reading the details of every vulnerability, um, how can we possibly decide what is an issue in our environment or not? Well, security is almost always a series of trade-offs, uh, particularly between effort and risk. Um, how much effort is involved to fix something versus the risk of it being an issue in my particular environment. So we have to make judgment calls on which ones to fix and which ones we might just accept. We don't have endless resources available to spend on fixing things, and so we need to um, prioritise. Um, unless we want to start digging into each vulnerability, understanding the specific circumstances under which we might be vulnerable, then the best way forward really is to decide on a strategy. So prioritization is, is really not an exact science. It can be based on a, a number of different factors. Um, severity alone doesn't really give us very much information other than potential impact. Um, the CVSS score, um, which takes into account things like exploitability, um, does give us more context. Um, but we can also use information like the maturity of available exploit code, and most importantly, if a fix is available. Um, high severity vulnerabilities which have an exploit and a fix are really a no-brainer to fix first. So, as I said, the CVSS score, um, taking into account things like exploitability and impact, um, it does give us more context, including details on how the attack can happen. And it helpfully provides this in a machine readable format in this vector string, um, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, uh, but understanding the output of our tools is also critical here. So we need to be able to filter based on criteria so we can just see the things that we should care about. Um, most tools provide ways of filtering those discovered vulnerabilities. So um, in the simplest case, if there's no fix available, for example, then it's likely there's nothing we can do about that issue for the minute. Um, again, high severity issues which have a readily available fix should also be a no-brainer. Uh, just apply them. So when we look at things in a slightly deeper way, there are obviously elements to this which are subjective. So for example, you might decide that a high severity vulnerability that requires shell access in order to exploit it is a lower risk in your particular environment because you have other controls in place to protect against shell access. Um, perhaps you don't sh have a shell in your containers. And so you, th you um, make the assessment that those controls mitigate that risk. Um, this is a more advanced kind of methodology. Um, it's probably higher risk unless you really understand what you're talking about. So really only go down that road if you're confident that you can make those assessments. And it's obviously a higher effort strategy. So you need to, again, assess the amount of effort involved versus the amount of risk that you may be comfortable with. And again, here your tools can help. You can usually build uh, filter pipelines based on that, that CVSS vector string. And because that provides um, a lot of information about vulnerabilities in a machine readable format. But a, a general reasonable strategy might be something like this. Um, no high CVEs in production, um, nothing with a mature exploit, and to apply all the patches which exist. And if you followed this, it would likely drastically reduce your overall vulnerability count in most cases. So now we've considered how we might use a strategy, um, let's take a look at how that might work in practice. So if we trust our upstream provider, then we're gonna start from a base image, we're gonna leverage that upstream provider um, and go to them for fixes in that, in that base image. And then we might have some common configuration for our specific environment. And this might be common to all of our images. You know, this could be a uh, configuration for our specific networks, for a specific auth. So this layer plus our original base layer um, could make up a common base image that all of our uh, teams are gonna consume. <laughs> 
Then we might have um, another layer of common software. Perhaps it's a, a set of middleware, specific versions of runtimes for our applications. And then finally, we've got a layer that adds in our custom code. So the applications that we want to deploy um, along with the metadata, any application specific configuration. And so based on those defined layers, when we think about vulnerability management within an organization, we want to be able to fix vulnerabilities once and have them effectively resolved everywhere through inheriting those fixes downwards in our distribution tree. And in order to do that, it's important that we understand exactly which layers cause that vulnerability and then we only fix it in that layer. So as we've said, one way to achieve this might be to establish our own base image. So uh, this is going to contain a, a, uh, a, 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 an upstream base image, in this case, the, uh, the uh, Python 3.6 Slim, um, then any generic configuration for our environment. And then we're going to maintain this as our base image. So all of our other teams will take this base image and use it to build, um, build their images. So we can then um, establish a baseline for that base image and anyone else consuming it only needs to worry about things that they've introduced through additional packages or software added to this. So in this example, we've got 178 issues in our base image um, right at the start of the process. But it's also important that we watch out for new vulnerabilities. So um, generally images that, are, that have just been released have normally have no fixable vulnerabilities, um, but things uh, do get broken, uh, things get fixed, stuff changes. So um, rebuild and set a new baseline pretty often. So then we might have a, a middleware image, which is going to take our our base image that we that we uh, built for our organization, and we're going to install a set of uh, middleware that perhaps all of our applications um, need in order to function. And so then, what we can do is to uh, to test the middleware um, uh, layer and see how many issues there are in there. And we can look, then look at the difference between what was in the base image and in our baseline and what's in the middleware image. And we know exactly which ones um, came from the, uh, from the middleware uh, layer. And, you know, in this case, we can see that there are really only two additional vulnerabilities which, uh, which, got, um, which got put into our image through the middleware layer because those 178 were actually in our base image. And then finally, we can use our middleware image to, um, to uh, produce our, our application um, image by adding our custom code into the middleware uh, layer. And again, we can then test our, our application code can be tested by the app team. Um, in this case, there are uh, this exactly the same amount of vulnerabilities that were in the middleware layer. So we haven't introduced any new vulnerabilities through our application layer. The middleware team are aware that they've got two issues they need to fix and the 178 issues are in the base image and that's going to be dealt with um, by upgrading our, our base image. So the final consideration here is that obviously our containers almost never exist in isolation. Uh, we're typically running them in orchestration systems, um, usually Kubernetes. And so our security isn't just based on dealing with vulnerabilities in our applications. Um, the blast radius of exploits is almost always a combination of application level vulnerability um, combined with infrastructure misconfiguration. So it's really important that we consider our security as multi-layered. And a container image which causes a single pod to be exploited is clearly not a good thing. Um, but a container image that allows your entire cluster to be owned is a much more significant issue. Um, security principles for Kubernetes are pretty well documented these days. Uh, you definitely don't want to be doing things like in this example, host paths, privileged pods, uh, not setting resource defaults uh, can all allow an attacker to significantly increase their foothold in your cluster um, to potentially devastating effects. So um, conclusions from this talk, if all you remember is uh, define your trust boundaries. So understand who's responsible for, for which elements of things that have got into your images. Decide on a strategy. Um, choose a strategy and, and execute that strategy um, in order to reduce your overall vulnerability count. <clears throat> 
and start with the low-hanging fruit. Um, high severity vulnerabilities that have a fix available are clearly a no-brainer. So um, start with those and then uh, worry about the other ones um, once you've dealt with the low-hanging fruit. So thank you for listening. Um, you can sign up for a free account at snake.io slash sign up. And um, hopefully I am here to answer any questions.